All right, so welcome everybody to this webinar on open educational resources. Uh, today's webinar, like many of the others that we do, it's gonna be pretty short. We're gonna try to cap it at about me, 20 minutes of just kind of talking and introducing this, the subject. Then we'll have some time for questions. And then some next steps or some uh, ideas for where you can go from here if this is something that really interests you and captivates your uh, something that you want to try. So let's get started. Um, the first thing we're going to take a look at is just what is OER or Open Educational Resources. Uh, and this is largely looking at or being aware of content that's available. Uh, and that could include things such as articles, books, and this would be textbooks, literature, research. There's a variety of um, different books out there that are available in this realm. Uh, audio content such as podcasting, recordings, audiobooks, images, arts, graphs, photographs, uh, videos, and then finally software and digital tools. And the what content that fits under OER is content such as this that is free to use and redistribute, uh, free to use within your classes and potentially to adjust or change as, as the case may be. And so uh, it's one of the benefits of the digital environment is the capacity which with, with which we can create and disseminate information, uh, resources, learning materials, etc. So how all of this happens is under a license um, and we'll talk about what that license looks like but usually it means you you have this content and you have the license with which to retain which means to hold on to right to keep to reuse so sometimes we'll get learning content that we can just use for like a one-time deal um, and then the rights go back to whoever the original copyright holder is revise. So sometimes you ever have a textbook where you find something in it that's like, mm, that's actually out of date or that's actually been changed because something just broke in the last six months well after this, this textbook has published. So this is the opportunity to actually revise uh, that, which you, you wouldn't be able to do in part because you'd have to get all of the students' books. Uh, and then also legally, you couldn't say, rep you know, reprint a page with the fixed content. Remix. So this is the opportunity to take different chunks, different materials, uh, and put them together in, in interesting ways, right? So maybe you like, you know, a section of this book, maybe you like a chunk of that article, and you want to put them together because you think they work really well. Well, with OER resources, that's one of the goals is to recognize sometimes it's not going to be just one source, but it's going to be several different sources that you merge together. And then redistribute, right? That's one of the biggest things here is the opportunity and the ability to take something uh, that, that has been created potentially by you or somebody else and to freely redistribute it across different uh, platforms. So that's, those are what we call the five R's of OER. Uh, and taken together, they really do empower not just the student learning experience, but also the instructor's capacity to create meaningful content, meaningful timely content that they can continue to update, continue to share or change as fits their needs, as fits their students' needs. So this is gonna look a little complicated, but I assure you it's not. Um, the major licensing platform that OER hinges upon is called Creative Commons. And Creative Commons is a uh, organization that about 15 years ago saw that in, as we moved into the digital age, all, you know, there was all sorts of new complications around copyright. And so what they came out with was the, what's called a Creative Commons license. And this is a license that is kind of, that is layered on top of a copyright. So that if somebody creates something, and in our society, in US society, when you create something, you are given a copyright of that. You don't have to file for it. You don't have to do anything to, the, the act of creation is what creates the copyright. You can file for copyright to try to protect against lawsuits and things like that. But at the end of the day, uh, if you've created it, it is yours by, by legal right. Creative Commons licensing is a layer on top of that says, well, that's how it is, you know, the, the copyright is created no matter what, but how do you make sure that you can freely 
give to other people materials that you may have created for them to use without everybody having to come to you and say, hey, can I have permission? Hey, can I have permission? Right. And so Creative Commons license is just this license you put on top of your career, your your copyright so that other people can use it uh, as they see fit. And there's four ways or four potential restrictions if you use a Creative Commons license that you can put on your work. Uh, the first and most obvious is the attribution. And that is just making sure if somebody out goes and uses your work that you are properly attributed. Um, that makes you know pretty well sense of making sure other people know that this this originated somewhere else. The next is share alike, and what that means is I kind of think of this it, almost like a cold, right, or or a virus that if I create something and I give it a share a like Creative Commons license, somebody else can use it and do something with it. They can add on it, they can change it, or whatever. But they also have to give it a Creative Commons license. So this has been really an interesting piece to see how people use this to kind of make sure whatever they create, other people also have to, um, if they do anything with it, produce it, republish it in some way, it also has to be a Creative Commons work. Non-commercial means, you know, put it when you're adding that Creative Commons license, you're saying you can't, you can't use this in some way for, profiting on a to, to commercially profit from and then non-derivatives means you can't do anything with it besides reuse it or uh, reshare it that is you can't edit out pieces of it you have to take the thing as a whole you can't change or splice or edit words so those are the four license those are the four uh, basic tenets of creative commons that when you create something you can give one Actually, you can give all four or you can give none. Uh, if you give none, it's actually considered a public domain work and therefore uh, that means you don't do attribution or anything like that. Now, the, the statistic I'm about to share is probably about two or three years old. I wasn't able to find a more updated one, but uh, you know, as of two, I wanna say about two years ago, uh, there were over 1.1 billion artifacts that have Creative Commons licenses. Uh, and as you can see, those are platform, those are all platforms there that host Creative Commons licenses. So everything from Flickr to the Internet Archive, to YouTube, uh, you have MIT Open Courseware, all of that stuff has Creative Commons licenses, or most of it does. Uh, the Public Library of Science, where a lot of open access research is published under Creative Commons licenses. It's pretty vast. Uh, there's lots and lots of material and within academia, a lot of people are invested and interested in putting things in uh, publishing things or creating things with Creative Commons licenses. So it's, it, if you haven't heard of it before, it is a much bigger phenomenon than what you may have first thought of. And so when you are looking around uh, at the bottom here is what you'll see is often the license uh, it's that little CC by SA. That means this would be a, uh, the, the licensing here would be uh, making sure to give attribution and then also it would be share alike. And that's typically for me, a lot of the stuff that I create, I will create with a buy and uh, share alike so that again, people continue to create and share out more of this content that others can use in the, you know, in the process of teaching, learning, research, what have you. So why use OER, right? That's, that's a really good question that uh, is usually one of the first that, that faculty are asking. So I think for students, there are some really good reasons why you wanna be thinking about how you might take your traditional learning materials and make them either find replacements for them, make something or uh, adjust something so that they are free and open to your students. Because um, the first is if, for those that aren't aware, like textbooks are increasingly, some would say atrociously expensive. Uh, you know, even at Brandeis, we see textbooks that are two or three hundred dollars, um, and that's a lot. Uh, you know, we we talk a lot about the costs of education, and this is one of those areas where we potentially can save students, or you know, a few thousand dollars over the course of their education. Now that may not be huge, but it's at least something we know as instructors, as people who are face-to-face -face with the students, it's something we know we can do. 
increasingly we see students that won't or can't buy the textbooks. And so there's, uh, there's a decent amount of research, uh, particularly from Spark, that shows there is, you know, students will forego buying. Um, or on some merits, they may not, you know, they may choose not to buy it, but it's more often they can't afford to buy it, but they'll still go forward with the course. And we know that has a negative impact on their learning. Another really good benefit that's less about the cost is about just access, right? So some of us have, been, have certainly taught where like, you hear from the students, they haven't been able to get, get hold of the book or you, they, there's some kind of access pass they have to purchase and the code isn't working, et cetera. This is a situation where if you use OER, that content can be readily available the first day of class or earlier. Uh, I've certainly in my courses at times, uh, I've sent out an email to the students with kind of a, a, a link to a Google folder where they can download all of the PDFs that are, were being used in class because I've made sure to you know, use open educational resources or public domain material. There's also the question or there's also the importance of permanent access. A lot of publishers now are selling e-textbooks and e-textbooks typically are not, students are not buying ownership, they're only buying access, which means after 12 months, they'll lose access to that book. Um, or if they're buying an e-book on some other platform, they may, that platform may not always be around. So the idea is that with using OER, you can allow for students to download and hold on to those materials. They're no longer constrained by increasingly, um, well, just uh, troubling practices by the publishing industry. And then you also get a wide, a wider range of materials. You know, th this idea that one of the things in to be clear, I teach courses like English and, and literature and history, uh, courses where reading is essential. But one of the things that I keep coming back to is a book doesn't, you know, a book isn't always the best thing for learning. Uh, you know, there are things that I've seen where you can spend 10 pages explaining a process or you can have a one minute video and guess which one's gonna stick longer is going to make more sense. And so one of the things I like about going to OER is you're no longer stuck to having to use a specific text or a few set of texts and therefore feel limited to expand beyond that. You can really think about what is, what is it that they're learning and what kind of materials will make most sense and can I find different materials for these different things. Um, it's a really expansive approach. But for the faculty, there's also a lot of other benefits to consider as well. Um, the first is just the ability to, to edit and update, right? So again, you have, if you're using an ebook or an e-textbook or even a you know, physical text, you don't have the opportunity for any editing or changing of that material. You're stuck with it the way it is. On the other hand, sometimes, a, you're, you're using a book and a new edition comes out and now the, pub, the publisher or the, the bookstore is no longer selling the edition that you really like. Maybe the new edition doesn't have a couple of the essays that you like. Maybe the new edition, you know, the, the pages have been all changed up or the questions aren't as good. Well, you're stuck with using that new edition, right? Because the, the old version isn't being published anymore. With OER, you have control of the version. If you want to update it, you can, but you're not subject to the publisher updating it. And then there's also, again, this idea of flexible content. You can be using this material, you can be integrating other material, you can cut and paste what works and cut, you know, and take out what doesn't. Um, and I really like that part is like sometimes, you know, you have three chapters of a book that are great, and the rest of them for your course are, are of no use. And the thing that I see really powerful is this idea of expansive choice. So one of the things I see a lot, uh, a lot benefiting both in practice um, for the instructor and for the student is thinking about, well, do I always need one particular source or can I give students the options of two or three different sources? Maybe I can throw in a podcast, a article, and uh, maybe this book chapter and let them decide which one works the best for them. And it's also opened up a lot of new, uh, new teaching strategies. Open pedagogy is an offshoot of OER. And what it is about, and we'll see an example shortly, is really getting the opportunity to play around. Uh, having students actually start to edit, as contribute to the learning resources, or getting them to think about how can they enhance the materials, not just for themselves, but for future classes. 
So here are a couple examples that I've seen over the years around, or I've either seen or I've helped to use, or that I've used, or that I've helped other faculty with. Uh, so I mentioned teaching a literature class. I've taught uh, American literature for several, or for, gosh, uh, 10 or 12 years now. And I love the fact that, particularly when I teach American Literature one, I no longer go with that giant textbook that costs like a hundred dollars and is filled with all sorts of text that's in the public domain. Uh, I just go to a variety of websites and grab links to different readings. And that's allowed me to kind of play a lot more, to, to play around a lot more with my resources, uh, to think about how I want to structure the course and not worry about, gosh, I made the students pay a hundred dollars for that giant book that's mostly filled with like tissue paper, thin paper. Uh, so it's been, it's been really useful to see that. Um, I've seen faculty members that, a faculty member that teaches an algebra class to uh, take a variety of videos and start to use those for the teaching or for the homework and problem solving and essentially just create a series of guide notes around like where he knows his students traditionally get caught up and have those in conjunction with the videos and forgo needing a textbook. Biology, I've seen people do, uh, I, I've worked with, with uh, two faculty members and they created this series of videos to walk students through the lab sessions. So again, rather than buying the lab book, they actually created the video process for them to walk through. Uh, another colleague I've saw basically created an entire Spanish uh, language. It was Spanish for the health professions and created an entire website uh, with all sorts of interactive content so that uh, they didn't, so that she could have that, she could update it as the language changed or as new trends came along, but wasn't dependent on anybody. Uh, here at Brandeis, um, Peter Gould actually published a book around peace studies and he pulled together essays that he wrote as well as the students uh, so that future classes could read those and, and start to engage with those. Uh, and then also in a cultural studies type course, uh, created learning guides that then, and this is where that open pedagogy comes in, students started to contribute to. So over the years, those learning guides weren't just what the instructor created, but were also representative of what the, the students were learning or bringing in from their own experiences. All right, so there's three main approaches to using OER. Um, we, call these, we call this uh, adopt, adapt, and create. So adopt is really about curating. It is looking around, seeing what's out there, and finding the best resources that you think will work for your class. Adapt is finding something, but needing to revise it, needing to edit, update, change, pull in a few things, mix in a few things. Essentially, you're, you're taking somebody else's work, but making it more of your own or more reflective of the learning experience you want your students to have. And then there's build, which is you essentially start fresh or, or pretty fresh and build something out entirely. Um, and in terms of intensity of time and resources, you know, this, this is a pretty good continuum. Adopt is often the lightest. That being said, there's still a lot of work involved in really trying to find the right resources, read them, review them, et cetera. Um, adapt gets a little, more, a little more invested in time and then build obviously takes a lot of consideration. And in terms of what's out there, as I said, there's over a billion uh, Creative Commons materials, but more particularly what people are looking for is, of course, OER materials, materials that are focused for teaching and learning. So here are some resources that are definitely worth checking out. OpenStax is by Rice University, and I think at this point they have published upwards of 20 uh, college level textbooks on things from biology to physics to uh, psychology, like a lot of the a lot of the the, the um, early cor courses in career, in uh, in college, the the large field classes. They have a a lot of those there. Um, they have math ones on math, and they also have a lot of ancillary materials, so slide decks, uh, test banks, and the like. So there, there's a that's probably one of the best places to go if you're looking for um, something in, that, that is a lower level course. But then all of these have a lot of great materials that you can go out and find. Um, and sometimes it's not even clear or you're not, there's places you can go that uh, you didn't even know 
it was available there. For instance, YouTube, if you do a search and then go in and use the filter button, you can filter and find Creative Commons content or you can filter for Creative Commons content. Now, what that means is you can find videos that you really like and not just use them, but potentially download them or integrate them into other videos. So it isn't just a matter of you, you can use the content on video, uh, sorry, on YouTube, you can also integrate it if it has that Creative Commons license. And then YouTube at uh, Google as well has under its advanced search feature, the option to search for user rights and to identify stuff that is Creative Commons license. Also here at Brandeis, we have two uh, places to check out. One is that we do offer a affordable and open educational resources grant. Um, and you will want to check that out and kind of find out a bit more about that. Uh, Laura Hibbler in the library is the person to talk to, but I can also answer questions on that if you look and you think it's something you might want to apply for. I, I, I don't remember, I forgot to write down when the, the next round of uh, dates are, but uh, I would definitely encourage you to check that out. And then we also have a LibGuide here where of different uh, affordable and open educational resources that expands upon the slide that I just showed. So if any of this is grabbing your attention, if it's something you're really interested about that you think you know is worth exploring, um, then a couple things to, to do for your next steps. The first is, uh, find out how much your students are paying for learning materials. Maybe not just, you know, maybe for your class because it may be something you never thought about before. You just grabbed a, you know, grabbed a book and uh, told the, the bookstore to hold on to it. So sometimes, and this has happened before, you know, because, and this is sometimes how it's intentionally set up is that instructors aren't always told or made evident of the costs that their students are uh, imbuing for, for the learning materials. But just also talk to your students and find out in general, like in a given semester, how much they are paying for. Uh, some of the, you know, one of the statistics that I've seen is, you know, in a given year, a student is paying a thousand dollars or so, a thousand to twelve hundred dollars a year for learning materials. Uh, and that, that, you know, for any of us is, never mind a student can always, you know, it's going to be painful. Start to explore the OER materials, see what's out there, see if there are things that you think might be useful. Uh, also reach out to me or Laura Hibla for additional assistance. You know, sometimes if you're first going into this, you can get a little lost, you can get a little, um, it, you know, it can be overwhelming. So going with somebody like that, that's been working with OER for a while uh, can always be useful. Think about applying for the, for the grant. Um, and then also we will have, we'll continue to have workshops around topics like these in the, in the months to come. So I encourage you to come back to learn about another topic as well. So I went a few minutes over, but how about questions at this time? Um, so if you have questions, you're welcome to unmute and speak up or to use the group chat, whichever works best for you. Do publishers allow creative, do allow a Creative Commons license for any textbook or is this likely? Um, publishers often don't allow. So that, that's one of the challenges is that publishers generally don't. It's more, instructor, or you either have platforms like open, um, uh, open tech, open stacks at Rice University that intentionally are making books with Creative Commons license, uh, with Creative Commons licenses. You do have some publishers that open intro is a great, oh, that's good to know. Thank you, Travis. Um, you do have some publishers that are playing around with open access, but they're less likely to be educational content. Uh, I see more with academic uh, research oriented books. So Alabasca University in Canada is an open access publisher. So they put out uh, a lot of books each year. So does Open, Publish open Book Publishers. Uh, they are both they are both publishers that publish open access books with the Creative Commons license. Or license. But a lot of the publishers right now that are publishing textbooks uh, generally do not do not do Creative Commons license, or they try to take stuff that is Creative Commons license and put a copyright on it, which is something they get uh, slammed for a lot. Yes, so that's the other thing, and, and I didn't cover it as much today, is that the, 
the library has a lot of great materials that you can use, right? So there's uh, a variety of ebooks, there's places like Safari uh, or O'Reilly books, especially if you teach technical courses or, or courses around technology. Um, and those are great. Like, and we, we always and will strongly encourage those. The one challenge or the one thing about those ultimately is those aren't open in the sense that you still don't necessarily have the editing abilities or the changing abilities. They're subject to the publisher. So again, you're still stuck in a situation where, you know, they could potentially disappear if the publisher decides, well, no, we don't want that one in our database for, for with libraries and things like that. Uh, and then also ultimately the, the library does pay for access to all of those. So it's great that we're taking advantage of it. Like, I don't want to dissuade you from taking advantage of the library resources. I use those all the time as well. Um, but I would also encourage or just make that distinction that those are accessible, but they're not necessarily open in the way that, um, that you would have if you have, were using material with a Creative Commons license. Uh, yes, I will be following up this video. I'll, be, I'll send out this uh, a link to this video and I can also send out a link to the slides because they're also covered by a Creative Commons license. Um, and just as a heads up for people that are interested, the next uh, webinar is later this month and it's on blogging for teaching and learning. Uh, I'm still here to, and happy to answer questions, but I also recognize we're about three minutes to go and you know, people have stuff to do. So thank you all so much. And uh, I look forward to hearing any questions that you have or any follow-ups that you'd like to um, check in about. The, the webinar tomorrow is actually the same one as today. We offer it at two different times, mostly just so people can, you know, depending on people's schedules and, you know, how things go. So um, it will largely be what you saw today. So you're still welcome to come back. It just <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. And yeah, if you have questions about this or you're interested in learning more, don't hesitate to reach out.